Good afternoon, you lovely people across the country. Um, we are uh, going to be looking today at history, AS level and accelerated sessions. My name is uh, Mr. Morrell, and um, as you can see on the left of the screen there, um, I will be doing a couple of sessions in a couple of weeks' time. But for today and next week, we've got Miss Thomas, who you can see on the right of the screen. All yours, Miss Thomas. Thank you. Hello, I'm Karen Thomas, and I'd like to welcome you today to today's AS history presentation. Now, the presentation is going to take run about 35 minutes in total. If you have any questions during the session, then please submit them using the chat function during the presentation, and I will go over as many as I can live in the last five minutes of the session. Now, what am I going to do in this presentation today? Well, I'm going to begin by giving you an overview of the whole AS course. Today's session is going to focus primarily on Unit 2. So there are eight topic areas of the depth study in Unit 2. I'm going to compare question 1 and question 2. I'm looking at the stems of the questions, the layout and styling of the question. And then I'm going to focus on question 1, which is the source question. So we're going to look at how to analyse the source today, how to write it up. I'll be giving you some top tips. We'll be looking at the WJC expectations and changing them into student friendly language. I'll be giving you a checklist to look over. I'll be giving you some possible sentence starters that you may want to use. And we'll also be looking at the WJC banding at level six. I'll also be giving you some annotation advice. So we're going to be going through quite a bit in today's session. Now, hopefully I'm going to be re, um, refreshing current sort skills that you have, but also maybe giving you some new ideas on how to evaluate the sources. So to begin, let's have a quick look at the overview of the AES history course as a whole. So in year 12, you will complete two units. You will do unit one and unit two. So unit one is your period study. Now that is going to be explained by Mr Morell. He's going to be looking at section A and section B, and you would traditionally choose one essay from two for each of those sections. And you would normally do an exam at the end of the year 12, one hour and 30 minutes. Now these sessions are going to be done on Monday the 15th of March and Monday the 22nd of March. Now I am going to focus on unit two today, which is the depth study, and I will be focusing in on question one, which is the compulsory source question, but also next session looking at question two, which is the interpretation question. So that will be done on Monday the 8th. Now traditionally you would have an exam for one hour and 45 minutes at the end of unit two. Now, even though we won't be going down the traditional routes of external exams this year, there is a high possibility that you will be required to answer some past paper questions as part of your assessments when you return to school. So I'm hoping that this session is going to be extremely valuable to you to help you to prepare for this task, as you will want to get the best mark possible in your assessments as evidence that you are capable and can, can produce that work at that standard or that grade. So there are eight depth study topic areas. I would have loved to have been able to produce a session for you today on content, but as you can see, it would have been an impossible task as your school or sixth form college may have chosen a topic area completely different to other schools. And with eight possible choices, I couldn't cover them all in one session. So as I go through the eight topic areas on the next slide, I'd like you to look out for the topic area that you currently study. Hopefully you will recognise it. So it's a depth study. That is what unit two is. So there's quite a narrow time frame. So you might be doing the mid Tudor crisis in Wales and England. That would be the course in year 12 and year 13. In year 12, you would do the part one. And if you did do unit one, then it would be problems, threats and challenges 1529 to 1533. And you can see that it kind of goes halfway in your time span because, of course, you would finish off the rest of the time span in your year 13 course. You may be doing depth study two, which is the pressure on the monarchy and the drift to civil war or maybe radicalism and the fight for parliamentary reform, which is depth study three. Maybe you are doing part one, politics, society and the war, which is Wales in England up until 1918, or possibly the Reformation, which is from Germany 1500 to 1531. 
Or maybe it's depth study six, which is France in revolution, which is the causes and course of the revolution. Maybe you could be doing in your school or sixth form the sectional differences on the road to civil war, which is the crisis of the American Republic. Or maybe you are doing Germany, democracy to dictatorship. And in year 12, you would be doing part one, Weimar and his challenges, 1918 to 33. So just remember in year 13, you would study the part two of the course, and that would be called your unit four. Now, the depth study here, um, number eight, is a very popular study choice with many schools and sixth form colleges, but it may not be your um, in-depth study area. So I have examples in my presentations from a range of different depth studies, uh, topic areas, but the main source example that we're going to use today is going to come from this topic study eight, OK? Right, first of all, what content do you need to know for your individual depth studies? Well, you need to look at the correct specification, first of all, for your particular depth study. And you need to make sure that you know it and understand it, and that you understand each key issue and content in that spec. Now, you have probably been given it by your school or colleges, but if you don't have it to hand, then there's a link here for the WJC website, and you are able to follow that link and type in specification, and it will bring up quite a lengthy document, but you are able to go in there, look at the unit two depth study topic areas find yours and it should look something like this okay this is from depth study option eight which is the Weimar now you will need to know everything in this section in depth okay all of the key issues and your content so if I was you I would start by knowing um, everything that's in that particular specification so just to recap the unit two, this is how it's all um, put together. You will do a question one, which is source based. You will do a question two, which is interpretation based. And traditionally, you would have this exam of one hour and 45 minutes. Now I'm going to look at the two um, stems of question one and two. Now the stems of the question never change. So your question one will always start with with reference to the sources and your understanding of the historical context, assess the value of these three sources to an historian studying, and then your key issue will be put in to that bit of the question. It is always worth 30 marks. Now, this is an example from May 2019, and it's from Depth Study 1, and you will see the three sources, and then you have the question directly underneath um, source C. This example is from the May 2019 Death Study 3. Now you can see here that they do sometimes use picture or cartoon sources, and then you have your B and C with the question directly under C. Now, if we zoom in to those two particular questions, OK, the depth study one and the depth study three there, you will see the stems of the questions are exactly the same. And that is the same for every depth study in this unit. OK, what changes is whatever the content is that you are studying. Question two, which I'm going to explain briefly because I'm going to do more of this next session. The question two is an interpretation question, so it will need you to use your interpretation skills. So this stem of the question again never changes. So historians have made different interpretations about the analyze, evaluate and use the two extracts above and your understanding of the historical debate to answer the following question. How valid is the view that, and again, this is worth 30 marks. So this is um, from Depth Study 1, again, the May 2019 paper. This time, it will be put on one side of A4. You will have your two interpretations, your extracts, and then you will have the stems of the question underneath. Exactly the same for Depth Study 3 example that I have here. And if we zoom in to the questions, you can see the stems of the question, OK, different interpretations about. The only thing that's different is the different interpretations and the viewpoints on those interpretations, OK? They will then tie in with the depth study that you are looking at. So hopefully now this has refreshed your memories on how Unit 2 is put together. You need to know your source skills for question one, and you need to know your interpretation skills for question two. 
But as I said at the start, today is going to be focused in on question one and your source skills to do with that question one. So all three sources will be primary or contemporary made at the time that you're studying. Now, as a guide, you should use around about 15, 10 to 15 minutes maybe to evaluate the sources and then 45 minutes to write up your response. And I'm going to take you through a step by step guide in how to do that. First of all, I'm going to issue a little warning, OK, a little official WJC terminology warning. This has come um, directly from the WJC and it says you will need to consider the strengths and limitations of the provided sources within the context of the specific key issue rather than the depth study as a whole. OK, so how would you do this? What exactly does it mean? So let's put it into pupil friendly and student friendly language. So in a nutshell, it's just asking you what is question one focusing on? So my first top tip is to highlight and underline the question's key issue. Now, this is from the 2017 Depth Study 8 paper, and this is the paper that we're going to um, do a lot of work on for the rest of the session. So if I zoom into the question that was directly underneath the source C that you just saw there, we know the stem of the question, we know that's not going to change, but the focus needs to be on the key issue. And the key issue here is opposition to the Weimar Republic between 1920 and 1932. So I would expect my students to be looking at that question immediately when they open the paper before they look at anything else. And it's that word opposition that is the key issue. That is what they need to focus their source analysis on. So with regard to the checklist, have we identified the key issue? Yes, we have. So the next step. So let's look at the next official terminology alert from the WJC. You need to debate and offer judgment on the value of the sources to an historian studying a specific issue with a focus on discussing the content, provenance and tone of the source, as well as the context in which it was produced. So another difficult one. How would you do this exactly and what does it mean? Well, let's look at the words that they're asking you to do something for. So you need to give a judgment. You need to give your opinion on something. And it's the judgment on the value of the sources, your opinion on how valuable the sources are that they have given you. You need to discuss their content, what is said in the source, the provenance. That just means the origin, where it has come from. And you need to comment on the tone. How has that source been put together? What's the meaning behind it? How has it been written? And you also need to put it in context um, of when it was written. So in other words, what was going on at that time? So we now understand what they want from us, but how would we do this? What exactly does it mean? So highlight or underline important or relevant information to the key issue in the question. So this is my top tip two here. Highlight or underline the relevant information in the attribution of each source first, because that will help you to put the source into context before you actually read the source. Now, the attribution is the bit underneath the source, OK? So what you need to do here is you need to highlight the main things in that explanation of where the source comes from. So it's a pamphlet, so we would highlight or underline that. It is issued by the Social Democratic Party, who are members of the Weimar government. It's circulated to the population of Berlin, so we have the audience. It's in response to the Kaputsch, so we identify when this is going on, and it's in March 1920. Now, another thing I tell my students to do as well is once they have identified the key issue, is to write that key issue, that one little word next to each of the sources, so that they know that they need to keep their source analysis on opposition because that is the question that they need to focus in on. They would then do exactly the same with source B, okay? So they would read, this is Adolf Hitler um, in his speech at his trial for treason in Munich in February 1924. Again, highlighting the important bits, who has written it or who has said it, in, as in this case, um, it's his trial for treason, it's in Munich and the date is obviously highlighted as well and the opposition is written again on this source. 
And the same with C, it's an extract, okay, which means it's part of a letter written by the German industrialists to President Hindenburg in November 1932. So if we go back to our checklist, the provenance of the source, yes, we have highlighted the provenance of the source, we know where it's come from, and we know those are the little bits of information that we need to write up about later on. Now, with regards to content, okay, we need to look at what the main points the sources are making. Now, what I'd like you to do um, is to just take um, not long, maybe 20 or 30 seconds to have a little read of the source. You might not get through it all, but this is a live event. You are able to pause it if you want to, to make sure that you read the whole source, or you will have a copy of this PowerPoint. So you might want to um, use it at your own will later and obviously stop it and be able to read it in your own time. But if I just give you about 20 seconds now, just to have a feel, have a read over the source and see what you think about what you would perhaps highlight or underline in this particular pamphlet. OK, don't worry if you haven't got to the end of it. As I said, you'll have a copy of this PowerPoint and you can do it in your own time. But I just want you to get a feel of what it's trying to say, because obviously, as if this was in front of you, you would be highlighting the important points or making some notes down the side of what you think you might want to comment upon later. If we do the same with um, source B, again, I'll just give you a little bit amount of time just to have a read over some of it. OK, scan, read it, see if you can pick up of anything of importance from this particular source. This is Hitler's speech, by the way. OK, so hopefully you have thought about maybe some of the source and what you would highlight or underline there. And finally, this C source, which is the extract of the letter written by the German industrialists. If you can have a quick look over this one as well, just to have a, a little bit of a, an idea of what is being said here. As long as you've done a couple of sentences, that will be fine. Obviously, you might be underlining other things to what I have done there, but this is the type of thing that you would want to um, perhaps talk about later when you did your write up. Now, some people like to read and underline the information in the attribution and then go straight into the source to analyze it. It's entirely up to you. I prefer to look at each of the attributions first and then go into the source, but obviously um, it's up to you. It's your own preference there. Okay, so back to the checklist. Content, we have highlighted important points that we may want to expand on later and possibly made some little points running down the side of the source as well on what it's saying. Now, if we just have a little look at some extra bits of information to do with the content, the date obviously has been addressed in um, the attribution as well as the authorship and the audience. The form, what that means simply is what form does that source take? So is it a speech? Is it a newspaper account? OK, it's as simple as that for the form. Language used, I will talk about that in a second in a bit more detail, but I'd like just to focus on this bit here for now, which says additional information on the topic. Now, there is a need, obviously, for appropriate reference to the historical context linked to the source. What that means is they want you to know what is going on at the time of that particular source. But there's an important point to make here. There are no marks for a display of knowledge. So if you wanted to put everything you knew about opposition in, um, which had no relevance really to the source, you wouldn't get any extra um, marks for that. You have to tie in your display of knowledge to the actual sources that they have given you. So you've got to put the historical context into the source analysis that you were dealing with. That's really, really important. Now then, let's look at the tone of the source. And this is what I was just talking about with regards to language. 
Now with Source A, this is the pamphlet, um, when you get a chance to look over the source in more detail, you will see that it's quite a bigoted um, left wing reaction to right source and the tone is there, it's coming across. OK, so we would treat this source with a little bit of caution because of those reasons. With regards to B, we've got um, Hitler's speech at his trial. It starts off quite respectful and yet goes a little bit more forceful as the explanations of why he did what he did in the Munich Putsch comes across. With regards to C, you've got the tone of the source coming through and, you know, it's at the beginning is quite a neutral tone um, in this letter and they're trying to present themselves of having no political stance. But then as the letter goes on, and I don't know whether you noticed this, if you had time to read all of it, it actually um, wants Hindenburg to appoint Hitler um, into Parliament. So we again have to treat this with caution because it starts off as a neutral source, but however we know that the industrialists would want Hitler in the position of power because they would gain from that move. So with the tone here, it starts off neutral but then changes. So you would make these little notes alongside your source underneath the heading of tone. So yes, we have covered the tone of the source as well. Now, with regards to looking at the source um, reliability, really, we've got two words that you may want to use, objective and subjective. Now, an objective um, source is a source which informs. It's normally very balanced and factual rather than being biased and opinionated. And subjective would refer to um, information that's based on personal opinions, or it might be quite emotional, okay? So if you can use these words in your write-up, in your analysis of the source, then that is great. So remember, objective and subjective. And also, we need to bring it back to the question and you have to look at the value of these sources, okay? You have to provide a judgment for each source on how valuable they are to the question of opposition. So what I tell my students to do, which they um, do quite well and it's obviously of use to them, they put a little plus and minus running alongside the sources. And as they read the sources and underline and make their notes, they're looking for any strengths or any value within the source that they can make little notes on, which they can then expand on in the write-up. So things like evidence, this is obviously showing evidence of the right threat, that there's popular backing needing, and it's reflecting the pessimistic mood of the time. The minus would be for weaknesses, any omissions, anything that's been left out, any biases or limitations. And of course, this is quite negative propaganda. So that could be mentioned as a minus point when it comes to the write-up. The same would be done with source B. And obviously the strength there would be that, you know, it's showing that there's still disgruntled Germans in 1924. This is important here, like source A, there's a need for popular backing. If you can link together um, something from the sources that is shown in, in a couple of the sources, that is a really good skill to be able to show in your exam um, or in your assessments. So like source A and here as well, like source A, um, your seizing power by force is not going to work as is shown in this source, as was shown in the previous source. So again, a linking of sources and putting it into context of what's going on at the time. The minus point, uh, the weaknesses, well, it is obviously propaganda. It's a speech where he's trying to turn something that didn't really work out into a triumph. Um, it's a very patriotic speech, it's in defence of, of the putsch that he's taken part in. So we treat it with caution because of those reasons. And we do the same with Source C. So we've got pluses, that is a 1932 nationalist movement that's sweeping through the country. It re reveals the disignity um, within the right. And the minuses is that, you know, the industrialists are calling for a rebirth, which would suit them. Um, but it's failing to mention, of course, because this was written in 1932, that at this time the Nazi support is actually declining and they are getting less votes in the November 1932 elections. So you're bringing in um, omissions naturally that you know about into this source analysis. And also it doesn't mention the divisions that were within the Nazi party at this time. So again, you would get some marks there because you were showing your extra knowledge, but it is in relation to this source. 
OK, so if we go back to the checklist, the judgment has now been also um, made. The notes have been made. Now, with re reference to the checklist, um, there should obviously be on your paper lots of highlighting, underlining and notes in that first 10 to 15 minutes um, while you're analysing the source. Now, you should be underlining the key issue in the question, the source's attribution and information in the source itself, including putting the pluses and minuses and commenting on the, the tone of the source. And all of these little notes can then be used in your actual write up um, and it'll make you do a very focused and detailed source analysis um, on these particular sources. Now, a very important point to note here is that examiners and teachers do not want to see a formulaic pre-learnt um, set in stone structure um, to the writing up of the sources. And what I mean by this is they don't want to see every source analysed in the exact same order with exactly the same structure and they want to see it written up in a flowing way so it doesn't matter what order you do all of these in your checklist as long as you address them and they're all written in your source analysis and covered it might be an idea what i tell my students is as um, you have written about certain elements um, you can tick off or cross off some of the notes that you've made so you know that you've already addressed that and you know how many more parts you need to mention in your write-ups as you're writing them through. OK, now what I've put in here next is the actual mark scheme from the WJC on that paper that we've just done all our source notes on from the depth study eight. So on the next three slides um, we've got the mark scheme, but it is really, really important that I explain to you at this point um, this little word here that they have written in their write up before they go into um, the actual marking of the source A. And it says appropriate observations in the analysis and evaluation of the sources may include. So it's really, really important that you realise when you see what's on the next three slides, it's not a necessity that everything there has been written about. It is may include. Um, I always get many students saying to me, well, I wouldn't have put that, I would have put, and equally you would get marks for another relevant um, part of information that you want to put in, if it obviously is relevant. Um, so it doesn't all have to be included to get the top marks. So this is um, the WJC um, notes mark scheme for source A. Now it is a very, very lengthy um, piece of writing. I'm not going to read it to you or ask you to read it just now um, because as you can see, it is lengthy. It is um, quite a lot of information. And if some of you are using devices um, that are quite small to access this um, at the moment, then you might not be able to, to see, see it properly. So you will receive a PowerPoint and obviously you can go through this in your own time. You've got source B write up and you've got source C write up. But remember, it is may include these things. There are obviously certain things there from the checklist that you need to put in, but just bear in mind you might be wanting to put something else in and just because it's not there doesn't mean you won't get any marks for it. OK, so you've made your notes around the source and now you need to actually write up your notes. So remember, I mentioned earlier that examiners and teachers do not want to see a formulaic set paragraph repetition um, in your work. So I've been quite careful in the subjects in the suggestions that I've made here and I've included some really simple sentence starters and um, for the introduction, your main and your conclusion that you can adapt improve or maybe change to suit you on the day, depending on the key issue that you have got to address. So top tip four for your introduction. Remember in your introduction to focus on the word value and whatever the key concept or theme is that you have. So possible introduction sentences that you could use or, or adapt are the sources, whilst they all have their uses and are valuable to the issue of, and you'd obviously put your key concept in there. They do vary due to omissions or biases, which affects their overall value. Now, obviously, it depends on the sources they've given you. If there's any bias or omissions, you would obviously use the word that's more relevant. The sources are only small extracts, so not comprehensive to the topic of 
whatever your key issue is singularly. However, each hold their own individual values. They all have different opinions on, okay? So you could mix and match some of these to go into um, a suitable introduction which focuses on the value and focuses on the key theme or concept that's been given. With regards to the main body, some top tips here. It is absolutely essential that for each source, at least once, you write, the source is of value to an historian studying. Obviously, we focused in on opposition, but it might be the translation of the scriptures or whatever the key issue is. You use the words in your question here to make sure that you are showing the teacher and the examiner that you have got a, um, you're, you're fine tuning your answer to what is asked of you. Maybe some main body um, sentences like these could be used. Source A is of value because it suggests it was written by, this, this then further adds to its value because source B is relatively valuable to an historian studying opposition because, however, it fails to mention. And obviously you can then put in the additional info that you might have as long as it is in context. Whilst valuable, source C does need to be treated with caution because. So even if you struggle to understand the sources, a decent comment which gives you a reason for why the source is of a value to an historian study and whatever will give you potentially 20 out of 30. So remember that even if you're put off for the source and think I don't understand it, I don't know what it means. Remember you were looking at the value of that source and think about some of the sentence starters that we've got and do a good source analysis on what you do know about the source. All of the sources given will have a value. They will not give you um, a source that doesn't have a value. You just need to find what that value is. And also remember to give mini judgments on each of the sources that you look at. So remember to use your highlighting, your underlining and your notes and also cross them off when you're using them so you know that you've addressed those issues. So analyze and evaluate the source in relation to the key issue in the question. Consider the strengths and limitations, the content, the provenance, you know, where it's come from, the date, the tone of the source, the audience that's going to receive it. Make reference to the historical context in which they were formed. Look at the reliability, is it an objective or subjective source? Give a judgment and link the sources if they have any um, positive links. And also use the term treat with caution because to explain if there are limitations or biases. But always remember to tie it back to why it is of value because it always will be. So what I've done here is just these are the little notes that were made alongside the source right at the very beginning when we started the source analysis. And I've just put in here the sentences that obviously you would expand on from those little notes that you have made around the source. OK, and the same with source B. And the same with source C. OK, so we come to the conclusion. What we need to do now is to compare the evidence across the sources. We have done individual judgments. We now need to look at the collective value. So some of these sentence starters again could be used or a version of them. So collectively, the sources are of value to an historian studying whatever the key issue is. Or maybe in conclusion, the sources are very valuable to an historian studying. The three sources do provide you scenario value. They have different opinions of, but when used together, they are of greater value. However, each have their respective omissions or biases. They're small extracts. They're not comprehensive to the topic singularly, but together they provide insight into. Now, these are all really good things that you can expand on in your conclusion or maybe which when used together provide a balanced overview. You're basically bringing the sources together here in the conclusion and saying that collectively those three sources are obviously very, very valuable to the, the topic area that you are studying. Remember to reiterate that the sources, whilst they all have their uses, they do vary in value because of emissions which affect their overall value. However, when they're used together, they are of more value on the theme of and bring in that question again, okay, your key issue there. Altogether, the sources, though limited and only extracts, work well together to provide a balanced and conclusive view for an historian looking at. Okay, so 
a mixture of whatever you think is, is going to be useful to you could be used in these sentence starters to make a really good thorough conclusion. So have you discussed utility, discussed limits, put your source into context and given a judgment? If you have, then you have followed the checklist and you have got a very, very good source analysis. I've got here just some general do's and don'ts. So don't assess the source from a formula and you know what I mean by that now. OK, it can't be a structured um, sentence starter in a pattern that is obvious. It needs to flow. OK, you have to comment on more than just the content and the attribution. You have to bring in the um, context in which the sources are written. You have to show off your knowledge in that sense. You have to look at the strengths and the limitations of the sources. Do not copy long sections of the sources out. There's no need for that. And there's no need for a long historical introduction or irrelevant background material. Remember, this question wants to see your source skills. And you also don't need to rank the sources in any order. Now, I've got here the WJC um, band six characteristics. OK, then band six is the top banding when it comes to marking. So have you got a sustained and accurate analysis and evaluation of the sources? Have you considered their content, their provenance and their tone? Have you looked at the context of the set inquiry? Have you reached a full and substantiated judgment? And have you, regarding the value of the sources, referred to it as an issue as a whole? And if you have, you could be accessing that top band of level six. I've also included this, which is um, just for reference, really. Some of your teachers and definitely the exam board would use this in their marking. It would be the little code that they would write down the side of the paper to explain how they've marked your work. So if there's an S, it means that you have somewhere in that section discussed the strengths of the source. Um, L would be the limitations, the attribution. Um, you would have valid source evaluation. Um, the context would have been um, discussed. The value of the sources to the historians would have been um, contributed to. Omissions would have been covered and also narrative of events would have been um, maybe put in, but you don't want too much of that. Now, this is just another checklist for you, put in a slightly different way for the people who like to see it in a, perhaps a little bit more thorough um, way. So when evaluating the sources, Remember, these are the things that you should be doing in your source analysis when you're looking at each source. So the next step for you students, what I would do if I was you is to ensure that you know this, your specification. So you need to know your depth study and you need to know what your spec is. Remember to download it if you haven't already got a copy. I would then, if I was you, practice the techniques that have been given today to evaluate your depth study sources, maybe using past paper questions or examples given to you from your teachers. Or if you don't have any, you could access the past paper questions and mark schemes from the WJC link that I've provided there. And then actually time yourself, time yourself writing up your notes, do your highlighting, your underlining, um, use perhaps some of the sentence starters that I've given you today or your own if you have your own bank and focus your answer on the question. And remember to stick to the timings, 10 to 15 minutes to evaluate and make your notes and 45 minutes then to write up. So next week's session, which will be on the 8th of March at the same time, I will be focusing on the question two, um, the interpretation skills, but I will do a refresh of the source skills that we have looked at today. On 15th of March and 22nd of March, it will be Mr Morell who will be looking at unit one, how to manage content and focusing on concepts and essay writing skills and developing reasoned arguments. So thank you very, very much. It's quite an in-depth presentation. I had a lot to get through. So um, thank you very much for joining. Now, if you have any questions, then I will be available now to answer them on the live chat function um, until the end of the session. But we've only got a couple of minutes. So if I don't manage to get through all of them, then I will actually put some in um, if we have any onto the next session so I can answer them at the beginning of our next session next week. So thank you very much. I hope you've um, found the presentation of benefit to yourselves. OK, so I'm just going to go into the chat function now to see if there are any questions that need 
answering. Um, if you do have a question and you want to submit it now, then please do, and I will uh, do my best to answer it. Some of the questions that um, my current six formers will ask are things like, um, do we need to evaluate the sources in order um, and do A, B, C first? Um, you don't have to, OK, you can start off with whichever source you want. Um, normally they are put in a chrono chronological order, so that is something that you want to do um, in the order that they're given to you because it, it sort of flows cr in chronology, um, but it's entirely up to you if you want to do it that way or if you want to reorder them. It's the explanation and the write-up of the content that is really, really important. Right, I'm afraid that we're out of time now. The 40 minutes are up. So if you do have a question, then please still send it through if um, I haven't already received it. And um, I will start the session next week on the questions that some of you may be asking. So thank you very much for joining today.